Thanks for tuning in today, everyone. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I think we're all set now. Um, I'm Danielle Bose. I'm one of the shelter med interns at Cornell. I'm an OVC grad from the Ontario Veterinary College, um, which is part of the reason why I was interested in this topic. Um, some of you may know that Ontario has uh, pretty strict uh, breed-specific legislation in place for several years now, so that's what we'll be talking about today. So just to start with some of the basics, about 83 million dogs live in the US, and this is based on the APPA National Pet Owner Survey for this year. About 50% of all US households own a dog, but unfortunately there's no national reporting system for a dog bite. So some of the data we get um, is from different sources and sometimes can be challenging to actually collect. Dog bites are reported to be fairly common. Uh, about 4.5 million people per year are estimated based on a random digit dial survey that was done by Gilcrest, the second reference there. And about 800,000 people or one in five seek medical care per year for dog bites. The good news is uh, fatal dog bites are not quite as common. We're at about three fatal dog bites per 10 million dogs per year. So who's at risk? Children are the most at risk, especially those in the younger age group of five to nine years old. About a half of reported dog bites are to children under 12 years of age. And children often receive medical care more than adults. Um, some theories as to why this could be, adults maybe are more vigilant in taking their children to seek medical care, or it could be also their, just their physical size, they sustain more serious injuries than adults do. People with dogs in their home are at a higher risk, and the more dogs, the higher the risk is. And a couple theories behind this are that you just have an increased exposure to dogs, and thus an increased exposure to dog bites. Additionally, they postulate that people who have dogs consider themselves more familiar with dogs and then take risks that may lead to dog bites that other people may not. And risk also decreases with age in adults. So a dog's tendency to bite depends on at least five interacting factors, and they include heredity, which includes breeds and genetics, Early experience and later socialization and training kind of go hand in hand. So did the dog have positive human interactions when they were younger and throughout their training? Did they learn that hands were sort of a chew toy? Did they learn that if they growl, they got reprimanded so then they don't give warning signs anymore? Things like that. Health, um, both medical and behavioral. And there's a couple studies that look at um, which dogs tend to um, result in dog bites, and about 70% of dog bites are inflicted by male intact dogs, so that's a concern. Um, and additionally, a large portion of dogs that are seen by behaviorists for dominance issues or for aggression issues um, are also male intact dogs. And finally, victim behavior. So what did the victim do prior to the attack, during the attack, and after the attack? And an important point is that uh, breed-specific legislation focuses only on the first category, so one of the five big factors. So this was a paper that came out pretty recently in December um, by Petronik and his crew. Uh, they looked at potentially preventable fatal, uh, factors in dog bite-related fatalities over several years. They found that multiple factors were potentially under the control of the owner which was pretty interesting. Um, some of the factors they found that were very significant were the absence of an able-bodied person to intervene in the attack, so usually that was some sort of adult being able to intervene. Oh, sorry. Additionally, they found that if the victim had no relationship to the dog, then that was a factor, so they postulated that if a dog had something new or novel in their environment, their ability to react and respond to human cues was was altered, and so that could have resulted in a more serious bite. Additionally, talking about failure to neuter dogs again, compromised ability of victims to interact appropriately with dogs, so those were children, people who were intoxicated or had mental disabilities um, or were experiencing medical problems such as seizures, that type of thing. Additionally, they found that dogs that were kept isolated from regular human interactions um, 
was a big factor. And they thought that um, this was probably one of the largest factors contributing to dog bites. And they said that um, they weren't able to basically read human cues appropriately or to get feedback from humans during certain situations. Owners prior mismanagement of dogs, so perhaps they had a prior charge of letting the dog run loose or another dog bite history. And then a history of abuse or neglect. And the important point was that breed was not found to be a contributing factor. So the million dollar question that everyone wants to know is what can be done to effectively reduce the number of dog bite incidences? And one measure that some places have put into place is breed specific legislation which essentially is um, legislation that bans, restricts, or imposes conditions on owners of specific dog breeds that are thought to pose a greater risk of biting people. <clears throat> so there can be a complete form of ESL, which is basically that the dogs are completely banned, they're not allowed in the area, or other conditions could be um, mandated, things such as mandatory spay and neuter, muzzling, special insurance or licensing, um, if you sell the dog, then you need to provide notification or they might not be allowed in government or military housing. So all forms of BSL. Some common breeds that are seen um, to be banned from BSL are any of these breeds. So the Bulldog, the Pitbull Terrier, King Corso, Chow, Wolf Hybrids, um, and they could be any or all of these. Um, they also target mixes. So they could have mixes if your dog is part pit bull, then it could still be part of the band. And pit bull types is an ambiguous term, just to kind of note. They, it includes dogs of all, all sorts of phenotypes and breeds and backgrounds and genetic backgrounds, so that's a really ambiguous term and it can be hard to actually define what that means. Mm -hmm. So basically we're wondering, do certain breeds, are they more likely to bite than other breeds? Um, and looking at the lit review, there's not really support supportive evidence to assume that one breed is more likely to bite than another. And they also mentioned that no group of dogs can be accurately considered disproportionately dangerous. However, it is challenging to calculate breed specific rates for a number of reasons. There's reporting biases, so the media can report certain breeds as more likely to bite than others. Accuracy of a breed definition, which I alluded to before, so it's hard to actually know what breeds are which by visual identification. And also a lot of times mixed breeds are misclassified as pure breeds. So you'll see in the news that it was a golden retriever, so it was one specific breed. Underlying causes, and this alludes to the fact that um, some dogs, um, stereotypic dogs such as pit bulls, have, um, may have underlying causes such as the owner's um, criminal record or criminal behavior as the cause of the dog bite as opposed to actual breed. Number of bites can be challenging to calculate, so there is no national reporting system, and so it's just usually based on ER data or hospitalization data. And total number of dogs in a community is usually unknown, and the reason we want to know that is if, say we have 100 German Shepherds in a community, um, and then another community has 10 German Shepherds, and we have a number of bites based from a German Shepherd of five, five out of 10 means a lot more, a lot different type of result than five out of 100. So does BSL actually work? And the short answer is no. Experts consistently agree, so there's a lot of literature that has looked at this, um, that dog bites cannot be adequately understood by just looking at one factor in isolation. And breed-specific bans do not affect the rate or severity of bite injuries. So places that have had breed-specific bans in effect for many years, places like Spain, have looked to see if there's a difference after having the, le the legislation in effect and they have not found a difference. So why is BSL still popular? And Patronic, the article we're gonna look at closer um, in a little bit, postulates three reasons. Misperception of risk, stereotyping and misinformation, and erroneous belief about the efficacy of BSL. Can I ask a question? It's Sandra. Yeah. Don't you think that um, this is something that's come up in, in my community when people are talking about BSL? Um, I, it seems like there's other reasons besides just bites that some communities are considering breed-specific legislation now. And I don't know if that's something, are, are you planning to talk about that or is that something that you've thought about at all? 
like in our in our community, they're using a model from Michigan now to make an argument for breed breed specific legislation for spay neuter. So some places, I think California is a place too where they um, do partial breed specific legislation. So they only have mandatory spay and neuter for say pit bulls. Um, I don't think that there's data out there really supporting it that I found. Um, I don't know if somebody else has more information on that, but I didn't look specifically at that. Okay, yeah, there's there's some data that's being proposed, but it to me it doesn't seem like good data. Um, from uh, it's from Ypsilanti, Michigan. But uh, anyway, just something to think about. I think as we're talking about it, it was interesting because when I when we were having these meetings and we talked about breed specific legislation, and I talked about the expert opinion on breed specific legislation. Um, the people I was talking to understood that only to be talking about banning rather than to be talking about other restrictions as well, which I, I thought was really interesting. Um, and okay. I talked to somebody at HSUS about it last week, and they were like, well, no, that's why we call it breed-specific legislation. It's any kind of legislation that we're opposed to, not just banning. Otherwise, we would have just called it breed-banning. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a common misconception, too, just even within the veterinary field, but as well as with the public as well. So I, anyway, sorry, I just wanted to sort oh. of chime in on it. I'd be interested to see that paper. It sounds interesting. So looking at the first reason we think the SL still is fairly popular is that risk perception is often um, nonlinear and that there can be a large gap between what the public fears and what they think is true and the actual facts. So factors that can widen this gap are lack of control over the perceived threat. So people saying that dangerous dog is living next door to us, we can't do anything about it. Lack of info about the true nature of the threat. So pit bulls are especially dangerous and they can lock their jaws, things like that. And lack of trust. So a child was just bit or some other sensational event and no one's doing anything about it. So again, we talked about this, highly publicized events create an av availability bias. So people are more fearful than they should be about a cer certain risk. And again, quantifying dog bites can be challenging and as well as the injuries. So who actually seeks medical care? Are they the children because their parents are bringing them in? Um, where, when, and why do they seek medical care? So do they go to an ER or do they go to their primary physician? Do they go right when the bite first happens or maybe two weeks later when they have an infection? Do they go because of insurance claims, perhaps? So those are all interesting things that make it harder to know the numbers of dog bites. And then how severe is the injury? So most ERs have a severity scoring scale and dog bites typically score about a one out of six. However, the scale is meant for blunt force trauma. So there are some criticisms as to how um, appropriate that scale is for measuring dog bites when people may consider dog bites more severe just basically due to the increased infection risk um, or other things like that. So what data do we actually know? So this was from a National Electronic Injury Surveillance System program and they found that about 130 ER visits per 100,000 people per year. Um, other data from another survey found about 320 bites required medical attention per year. And the difference in these two data values could be due to the fact that the second one went to an ER and actually sought medical attention from an ER doctor, as opposed to the first um, data, there could have been, um, sorry, the, the other way around. The second data could have been people that have gone to their primary physician. <coughs> Another survey found that about three hospitalizations per 100,000 people per year is what they found. Found about 10 reconstructive procedures per 100,000 people per year. And they think the difference in these two numbers could be that these reconstructive procedures didn't require hospitalization. So they thought that perhaps they were less severe, but they couldn't prove it. So this is actually from the paper we'll be looking at a little bit more. So it's a chart showing um, different common um, injuries um, varying from least common, so on the left-hand side, the less common events, to the far right, the more common events, and you can see where dog bite related injuries fall. So um, an outpatient visit is more on the more common side, and then hospitalization is starting to get on the less common side.
So why are certain breeds more often stereotyped? And a couple studies have been inappropriately used in the past, and even despite a disclaimer cautioning against their use for breed-specific risk info. And there, the studies that are specifically um, cited often are listed in the Patronic paper. So this is a study that looked at a comparison of golden retrievers versus um, band breed dogs and on a temperament test to see how they did. And they used a standardized temperament test to compare the behavior of those two groups. And they found no significant difference between the two groups. And there's many studies like this. This is just one specific example. I'm sure some of you guys have seen these posters on the left. It's like, can you identify this breed just by looking at it? And some of them are like part Chihuahua, part Schnauzer. And, and basically, it's just to point out that it can be challenging to accurately identify breed mixes. And visual identification is not very accurate. And even people who work with dogs on a daily basis are not really great at identifying breed mixes. Again, this is from the Patronic paper. So he states that there's currently can I, no pub Can I ask a question before you go on? Yeah, from the previous slide. Yeah, did you, re did you read that more recent study where um, uh, shelter staff's evaluation of the breed or breed mix of a dog? Um, I didn't read it closely, but I wondered if you ran across it in your review of the literature. Did it actually closely correlate with um, whether the dogs were pit bulls or not? kind of went against what previous studies had shown? I didn't see that specific article. Um, I saw this article that's listed on the bottom. I saw one by actually Dr. Levy um, and a couple other people, but I didn't see one that they correlated um, to the, the actual breed. Is that, like it, that was a more recent one? It was, uh, if I recall correctly, it was a pretty different finding. That's interesting. Yeah, I'd like to see I that paper too. That might be. Yeah, there's a lot of conflicting information about some of these points, so it's interesting if there's more literature, I would love to see it. Um, so Petronic basically stated, and he's kind of an expert in, dog, in the dog bite field, um, that there's currently no published evidence supporting claims that BSL is efficacious, but there is evidence to the contrary, and there's a list of just a couple on the bottom there. So in addition to again, again, just to clarify, and I, I can ask Gary too, but I think when he's saying that, what he means is it's not efficacious at reducing bites, right? Yes. Yeah. Correct. Okay. So just yeah. I just wanted to clarify. I'm I I don't think there's evidence to show it's efficacious for anything else either. But there, it's this one county in Ypsilanti that's claiming that they had success using it to um, decrease shelter intake. Hmm. But at the, the, it's not published as, as data. They, I, I have it in a PowerPoint, but it was presented as um, they, so they passed their breed specific legislation, but then they also got an enormous grant from PetSmart Charities to, uh, <laughs> to spay and neuter like 500 pit bulls. Okay. Um, and so then they saw a decrease in shelter intake. That's interesting, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We just had a dangerous dog conference here at UC Davis, and there was the, um, an officer, an animal control officer from San Francisco. He too claimed that their breed specific spay neutering had decreased the number of pit bulls in their shelters by. That's in San Francisco, Cindy. Yep. That's it would mean. be interesting. I mean, at some point, for yeah. somebody to start looking at those claims yeah. because. It really was, it was fascinating to me when, you know, I sent out this whole packet of information on breed-specific legislation and when they were all talking about the spay neuter issue and they said, you know, I finally said, I was like, does it, I was like, I'm just curious, how do, how do you all take it that there's all of this expert opinion? I mean, basically every national organization in the country is saying they don't support breed-specific legislation. Mm -hmm. And they all said, they were like, well, that's not what they mean. They don't mean spay neuter. <laughs> They mean, you know, breed banning. We're not talking about breed banning. And, and I was yeah. like, no, that's not what they mean, you know. But yeah. anyway, so yeah. I just think more and more that topic comes up um, because, and the interesting thing that comes up with it is it's often people who are advocates for pit bulls who want to push 
the that kind of BSL through because they understand it, or at least people who understand themselves to be advocates um, for pit bulls who want to push that legislation through because they believe it would help the breed in the community yes. and yeah. lead yes. to less less shelter death. So anyway, that's I just wanted to, I think it's such an interesting, I haven't had time to research it as much as I'd like to, but I think it's an interesting twist on this. Um, that seems to be popping up a lot lately. Yeah, and I, I agree with, with you, Sandra, that I think there are other things going on in San Francisco that are helping to reduce the number of um, pit bull type dogs that they're seeing in shelters, and it's not just the legislation. But he, this individual was saying that he thought, I mean, I don't know that he, I, I'm pretty sure he didn't look at anything else. You know what I'm saying? Like, Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it would be really interesting to see, like, has the, has the number of those dogs coming into the shelter declined along with all the other, you know, because shelter intake in San Francisco is also going down dramatically. Right. So So maybe that's why, you know. I to not dismiss out of hand. I will say I've heard that. I've heard enough people who actually work in shelters in communities with various breed-specific legislation sheepishly admitting that they love it and that it feels like it's really transformed things for them. Yeah. Um, so that's why I wanted to bring worth, it up. It's worth thinking about whether whether it has a positive impact that is sort of embarrassing to all our preconceptions about breed specific legislation and whether that can be that if there is a benefit, if there's a way to keep the benefit without having some of the harmful impacts of breed specific legislation. Well, that's what I was going to say. Even if it is beneficial, it's still, I mean, there's lots of legislation we could pass, right, that would be completely discriminatory that might also be beneficial. Yeah. <laughs> what were but, some of the benefits that they were mentioning from Penn? Pardon me? Say, wait, can you say that one more time? Yeah, I was just curious. Um, you mentioned that Penn, um, sorry, not you, Sandra. I, I didn't hear the other voice, um, but they mentioned that Penn had some benefits that they noted, I was just curious as to what they were. Penn? Penn? San Francisco? No, she said Penn said that. I don't know. Maybe not? No mention of Penn. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I heard something. The shelters that I've talked to that sheepishly admit. Um, oh, yeah, that one. In the U.S. and abroad that I've okay. had this conversation. And what did they say were the benefits, or what did they like about the Their BSL? Their is that it was responsible for a dramatic decrease in the number of pit bulls entering the shelter and that that was transformative for how well they could do their job hmm. with regard to dogs. And um, Yeah, well, anyway, I guess I, I just, yeah. it's one of those things that I've heard often enough to be uneasy about dismissing it, even though I don't have time for to personally to really look deeply into it. Yeah, I guess it makes sense if you're banning a bunch of dogs out, it would decrease your intake just by sheer number, basically. But that that's interesting for sure. But I just don't understand who, especially in, like, it was very unclear as to who was deciding who a pit bull was. It seemed like it was up to this one individual when there is no actual pit bull breed. And he was saying himself, well, it's easy to identify the males that need to be neutered because he apparently would just stop people on the street. There were testicles, but that made it unclear as to how he would do it if it was a female. So it was just interesting. We lost you again. Oh, and again, it questions how much of it is legislation and how much of it is additional funding because we'd really have to pick that apart. True. Right. Like, like how do you, you have a huge that? grant, that's not legislation. That's just being able to neuter a bunch of pit bulls, and therefore when they come in the shelter and you say, well, hey, how about we spay the mom if you don't want any more pit bull puppies, and then you take right. them home and they say, okay. Right, because you have funding to do the pit bulls. I right. think there's, there's um, there are questions to be asked about it, but I would just, like, what I hear is maybe dismissing it out of hand of, like, it was probably a giant grant. Mm -hmm. And I will say I've just heard it in enough communities where I think it merits some open-minded investigation of are there benefits to animal control when an overrepresented breed, I mean, I think we could argue about we don't really know if they're pit bulls or not, and there's a lot of question, but, and yet when you go into shelters, you don't wonder, like, are there really a lot of pit bulls here or not? 
You're pretty right. sure there are, you know, when you're trying to deal with it. You're pretty sure there is there is a certain look of dogs that we can identify that we also struggle to manage in a lot of communities. And that in, in communities where there's a a ban in place, there's a sense that there's there is truly less of a struggle. It seems like we talk about with a lot of our interventions with intake diversion and with community cats, we talk about targeting a lot and I mean that is a form of discrimination, I guess, when you've identified a specific problem and that's where you're targeting your so, yeah, I think that's a great point. I was just going to say that. I mean, any time, I mean, it's not a form of discrimination, really, because you're not legislating. So that's the difference is um, it would be one thing to to be um, offering free surgeries for pit bulls. But I don't hear, uh, I hear some communities say that they see an effect from that, but probably not as many as, as Kate's saying that are saying it. And I haven't heard um, as many as Kate. There's just this one example I'm aware of who of a community that's saying um, that they saw the benefit, and they did get a big grant right at the same time, so it's hard to really know. But I, I think that does, it leaves us in a, and I'm saying this in a really thoughtful way of like, yeah, it's hard, because like, what if it really is helping and those animals are at risk, and then how do we it's sort of like our thing that we joke about sometimes that, you know, what if it actually did save more lives to have shelters stack carriers to the ceilings? What would we do then? Um, and thank goodness we know that it doesn't, so we don't have to recommend something that we don't want them to do. But in this case, you know, what if uh, sort of this kind of discriminatory legislation actually did mean less shelter death for those animals, you know, then how would we wrap our consciences around that um, is a tricky question that I think I, I think it really does deserve a little more of a look I think it would be uh, I'm curious about it I guess if, as I was you know talking about it, it I was trying to sort of make sense of it in this meeting that I was in and the idea that you know these animals are at risk and the uh, there's def definitely a desperation that is felt in the animal control um, side of things in terms of the number of animals at least identified as pit bulls that are coming into shelters and the difficulties that they have with placing them, that, you know, and they are looking for solutions. Uh, one other thing just to throw out there as we're talking all of that through is that it's interesting to me that spay-neuter becomes the thing that everybody's thinking about because in a way, at least where I am, it's not pit bull puppies that are getting relinquished to the shelter. It's older dogs. Um, and so that's another kind of question to think about as we think about like the effect that spay-neuter has is would there be some other intervention um, rather than just spay-neuter? Anyway. In um, Weiss's study, and I can um, forward this along to Mike to hopefully our smart site will work to forward it to the rest of the group, but of 96 dogs identified by shelter staff as being pit bull type, only four didn't have um, pit bull type in, as one of the breeds in their makeup. Um, so at that shelter, at least, the results of visual breed identification did correspond strongly with the wisdom panel results. Hmm. For what yeah, that's that worth. Hmm. So in addition to all of our other concerns, there's also the concern of cost of breed specific legislation as well. So this can be challenging to calculate for a number of reasons. Um, there's many intangible costs as well as quality of life considerations. Um, things such as volunteer and staff time, issues between communities, the medical costs and trying to confirm the breed, um, homeowner, homeowner's insurance, shelter support, and dogs' lives that may be lost. So this is actually from the Best Friends website, and I thought it was really interesting. Um, you can put in different areas. So for this specific example, we picked New York City, and it kind of gives you a breakdown on what they estimate the costs of BSL would be in that area. So they estimate the number of dogs at uh, one and a half million. They estimated the number of pit bull terri terrier type dogs, which are the commonly um, targeted ones for BSL, at about 100,000. And then they list on the bottom different types of costs, so enforcement, um, kenneling, euthanasia, litigation, and DNA costs for a total of about 14 million. 
So I just thought it was interesting. You can type in different areas, and they have set um, formulas to calculate this. And of course, it's not perfect. It's just a rough estimate, um, just to get an idea of what it would cost. So this is the article we're going to look at a, a little bit more in detail. Um, it's titled, The Use of Number Needed to Ban Calculation to Illustrate Limitations of BSL and Decreasing the Risk of Dog Bite Injury. Um, and it was by Patronix Slater and Martyr. It was in 2010. So they focus on number needed to ban as a novel method of demonstrating how BSL is unlikely to improve public safety um, in terms of dog bites. It's a calculation of a risk-based statistic, and it's based on the number needed to treat statistic that has been commonly used in evidence-based medicine for human um, interventions. So basically, um, we want to know what is number needed to treat, and if you take the difference of the risk before a treatment and the risk after a treatment and take the inverse of that, that, that gives you number needed to treat. It's the average number of patients who would have to be treated to prevent one patient from developing the outcome. And we'll go over some examples so this um, sinks in a little bit better. And typical ranges are at tens or at most hundreds of patients for human interventions. So it's useful because it's a concise and clinically relevant statistic. It gives you an, uh, a number and estimate, estimation to kind of put it, things into a frame of reference. It measures the expected effect of an intervention before you put it into place and communicates the potential costs and benefits of the treatment. So if we looked at BSL as an intervention to prevent an adverse effect, so in our example, it'd be the removal of a dog from a population to prevent a dog bite the number needed to treat could be calculated for BSL, and it would be referred to as number needed to ban. So in words, that would work out to the number of dogs needed to be removed from a population to prevent a single dog bite. There are certain assumptions that we have to um, keep in mind when we're doing this. Um, we have to assume that BSL would be 100% effective, which is often not, um, in removing dogs from the target area. Replacement dogs would have to have a propensity to bite equal to the general population, not the higher propensity that of the target breed. And a dog that bite injures only one single person. So basically we need two important values to calculate NNB. We need the risk that a person will be bitten and the proportion of dog bites that are due to that specific breed. So we can get the data, the first piece of data from a variety of sources. We talked about some of these. So reported dog bites, emergency visits, hospitalization, and insurance claims are typically where we might get some of this information from. And then this one's a little bit more challenging to get. Basically, um, in the paper, they looked at over 10 different um, literature reviews, basically, that um, looked at the maximum frequency of dog bites due to a single breed. And they picked a maximum of 15% of all dog bites could be attributed to any one specific type of breed. And they put it up to 35 for more serious injuries or insurance claims. So this is where we're going to do some math. So hang in there. And if you have any questions, let me know or stop me. <laughs> so if we're going to look at just ER visits for our first example, we need those two pieces of data. So we need the risk that a person will visit an ER due to a dog bite, so that's the first piece we need. And then the second piece is a breed-specific dog bite risk. So for this example, we're going to use the 130 ER visits that I mentioned before for 100,000 people per year and the breed-specific risk of 15%. So we need to figure out three, basically, um, calculations to get NNB. So first, we need the new risk that a person will be bitten. So it's going to be 85% of what it was prior, because we had a 15% breed-specific bite rate. And if we do the calculation of 130 times the 85%, it equals the 110 that we see here. So the new risk that a person will be bitten after BSL is put into place will be 110.5 ER visits. And then to figure out the reduction, there's going to be a 15% reduction. And so you take the 130 that we had from the beginning minus the the new risk to get 19.5 ER visits per 100,000 people per year. So this is the number that would be reduced by putting BSL into place. And then to fig figure out NNB, we take the inverse of the risk reduction. So 
So we take 100,000 over 19.5, which equals 5,000, a little over 5,000 dogs. So just to reiterate that, um, when I mentioned before, in human medicine, they typically use NNT in the ranges of 10 to 100, and this number is in 5,000 dogs that we would have to ban to prevent one ER visit per dog, uh, due to a dog bite per year. Does that make sense? So if we look at other examples, so if we want to figure out reconstructive procedures, we need those two pieces of data again, the risk of a reconstructive procedure due to a dog bite and then the breed specific bite risk. So the 9.3 that I mentioned before, and we'll use a higher value of 35, assuming this is a more serious injury. And this is going to give even higher values, which you'll see in a minute. So the new risk that a person will be bitten well, sorry, we'll need a procedure is 65% of what it was prior, so that equals 6.1 procedures per year. The reduction, so we have 3.2 less procedures a year. And the NNB, so the number needed to ban for this example would be 31,000 dogs. And if we use the same pieces of information to estimate hospitalization and insurance claims, um, to prevent a single hospitalization, using that rate of 2.8, we get 100,000 dogs. And a single insurance claim, and they estimate 4.8 claims per 100,000 people per year, will give us about 60,000 dogs. So I'm sorry, I have a question. Um, yeah. So just number needed to ban of number of dogs, that's per 1,000 or 100,000 people, right? So in order to get, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, in order to get 102,000 dogs banned per 100,000 people. Each one of those people would have to have at least one dog. Sorry, I'm a little bit confused about the question. The number needed to ban is per 100,000 people, right? No, it, it's just a total number of dogs needed to ban. Well, right, but I guess I don't understand the population. The popula wait, what the population is. Yeah, so a lot of times we don't actually know what the total population of dogs in a community is. So that's an estimate of it would be 100,000 dogs out of the total population of dogs in that community. Does that make sense? Not, not really, but if you want to go on, you can. In any community that has that rate of uh, hospitalizations for 100,000 people due to dog bites, you would right. have to eliminate, but that's the rate. I mean, there could be, um, to, to ban just, what, to prevent just one bite, they would have to ban 102,000 dogs. So so if they had less than that, you'd have to ban all of the dogs to prevent a hospitalization if you had less than 100,000 dogs. Remember, that's a rate. That's 2.8 per 100,000 people. Doesn't mean there's 100,000 people in that community. That's 28 per, um, that's 2.8 per 100,000, yeah. 28 per 10,000. I mean, that's a rate of hospitalizations, right? Yeah, I guess I'm just trying to make these numbers make sense in sort of a real world, and I'm not really sure how to do that. I think that's kind of the point is that they're so large that this isn't really realistic to the real world. Um, like I said before, with number needed to treat, the numbers are typically in tens to hundreds, so that seems a little bit more realistic. But these numbers are so high that they're almost unrealistic. So it's a good point that you're stating for sure. So basically it's saying that it's very implausible that BSL will have a, a positive effect in reducing the dog bites um, because of the huge numbers needed to, for it to be effective. Does that make sense? Can you go back, can you go back okay. to the chart? Go back to the chart, yes. Because both of those are rates over 100,000. So what you're going to end up with is just the number. So these two values at the bottom, is that what you're talking about, Evie? I'm, just, I'm trying to understand Sarah's question. Because you lose that 100, you lose that 100,000. I mean, that's just a rate of disease. That's all it is. You could have a million people in that community. You could have 50,000 people in the community. But that's just the rate of disease that's accumulating. So if you eliminate or reduce that much, 
So you, you would reduce 3.2 bytes per 100,000 people per year, right, by doing the ban. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. You started yeah. with um, 9.3. You reduced that to 6.1. So you eliminated 3.2 uh, procedures or reconstructed procedures per 100,000 people per year. Okay, or that could be, you know, it could be 0 0.32 per 10,000 people. I mean, you, you can make that, that's just a rate. That's, you can change that denominator to anything you want, right? So if you, if you, if you eliminate 3.2 per 100,000 and you want to know if I eliminate just one byte, then 3.2 is to 100,000 as one is to some number. Right? And that number is this huge number of 31,250. Got it. Is that? Yeah, I think I understand. I think that the unit, it's, it's the unit that I'm looking for is. Risk. So you're, you're looking at the reduction in risk by reducing 3. Point, you, you've eliminated 3.2 per 100,000. Now if you want to figure out I'm going to eliminate one, then 3.2 to 100,000 is one is to some X. And yeah, I think, I think my, my confusion was that the unit on the 31,250 is dogs per bite to be eliminated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's not because you're making the assumption that each dog bites only once. Right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's 31,250 dogs that you would need to ban to get rid of in order to eliminate one butt. Yeah. Dogs per bite. That's good. Oh, always the mask. <laughs> So this is from the paper as well. It's just showing the general trend um, that as NNV increases, the proportion of dog bites due to that specific breed decreases. So the different lines on this chart are just different data points. So the first one is ER visits in, I think it was Colorado. The second one is um, ER visits in all of the US. And then the third one was in Kansas. So it's just using different data because we don't have a national reporting system. Um, and it's just showing the general trend that if you have 15% of uh, dog bites are due to a specific breed, then you have to ban less dogs. But if you have only 3% of dog bites due to a, that specific breed, then you have to ban a much higher number. So things to think about, um, NNV is the number needed to ban to prevent one bite. So to, in order to prevent two bites, that number has to be doubled. And to prevent three, it would have to be tripled and so on. BSL does not involve complete bans, so muzzle laws, which would require much higher NNB, which goes kind of back to what Sandra was saying, which is a little bit confusing that they were seeing such a positive impact because, in essence, you'd have to ban such a higher number for it to be effective. So, interesting. Basically, um, looking at the muzzle example, um, many dog bites can occur in a home setting by a familiar dog when a muzzle would not be required. So basically the large values that we calculated for NNB really show that a BSL is unlikely to be um, efficacious in decreasing dog bite related injuries. And that there's high costs of BSL both in terms of dog life and the responsibility of pet owners and financially as well. And hopefully communication tools such as NNB can help illustrate how BSL is probably not that efficacious that we know of and narrow the perception gap. And hopefully people who work with animals can be well informed about BSL and step forward to address media portrayals and misinterpretations when they occur. This is just the last sentence from the paper and I thought it wrapped it up fairly well. Um, Patronix states, a better understanding of the improbability of making communities safer through BSL is essential if we're gonna turn the tide of public perception and encourage more rational breed neutral approaches to decrease human injuries from dog bites. So just some interesting trends in BSL. Um, there's a general awareness, um, I think for most communities, it sounds like there may be some conflicting info out there as well, um, are that it is costly, does not improve community safety, um, penalizes responsible dog owners, and is ineffective in reducing dog bites. 
both the Netherlands and Italy have re reappealed their BSL in the last couple of years, and they were uh, communities that had BSL in place for several years. And in the first half of 2013, three times as many communities have rejected or repealed BSL than those that have enacted it, and that's in the U.S. These are organizations, so very large organizations that oppose BSL, kind of an interesting point. And there, I'm sure there's many others too that I didn't put on the list. And you may have saw this, um, Obama put out a statement or the Obama administration uh, that research shows that bans on certain types of dogs are largely ineffective and often waste a waste of public resources. So I thought that was interesting to see up there. So basically with all this information, are there better strategies that we can put in place? So a lot of um, people are promoting a multidisciplinary approach, so to deal with those other four factors that BSL does not deal with. So they involve um, stakeholders from a variety of areas, so animal control, the veterinary community, the public, the health department, and local law enforcement. And we have to recognize that different communities will have different needs. Basically, they emphasize the importance of responsible pet ownership regardless of the dog. So basically it holds the dog owners responsible for the care, custody, and control of all dogs. And it involves active community engagement and involvement. And education is key, especially for children. They're the largest um, population of people that are bitten. So this is just an example from the city of Calgary who's had, I, it seems like, pretty good success with um, using this multidisciplinary approach. So just some examples of their standards are licensing and permanent ID for pets, spaying and neutering all pets regardless of breed, uh, providing training, socialization, and proper care for pets, not allowing pets to become a threat or a nuisance in the community, and obtaining pets from an ethically and credible source. And this was um, this is published by the AVMA um, back in 2001, so a while ago. Um, and it just gives a step-by-step -step guide to assist communities in taking a multidisciplinary approach. It seems really complicated and communities are like, I could never accomplish this, but it goes really step-by-step -step and walks people through it. So just some take-home points. BSL is a commonly used approach to try and reduce dog bite injuries. And it's largely been shown to be ineffective, but still remains in place in many places. New communication tools such as NNB can be used to clearly illustrate the ineffectiveness of it. And hopefully a paradigm switch to a multidisciplinary approach will be a future focus in our community. So I was just gonna say thank you to a couple really big um, people that have been involved in my internship. So Maddie's son, Janet Swanson, the Cornell University Shelter Med Team and family and friends. And I was gonna see if there's any other questions. Have you guys heard of the multidisciplinary approach to preventing dog bites, or is that kind of new for most people? I think it's interesting because it was <clears throat> present, you know, it came out of 2001 JABMA. Yeah. And so it, it, it was there, and now it's sort of kind of come full circle almost sounds like. I, I'm curious what others think. Why, why have we gone through this whole breed specific pan versus, and now come back to this. Um, I had a question that's somewhat related, um, but just about the genetic testing, the DNA tests and stuff. Like, how does anybody know how accurate those are? Because we sort of use that as our um, gold standard to judge how the people are are classifying the animals. Pit bull is not a breed. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. Is that there is no breed type that is pit bull. So it's still But what about for other breeds even? Um are the DNA tests do, I mean cuz I think they're used in legislation and stuff or in um legal cases and stuff like that, but I've just always wondered so maybe it's a discussion for another time. I don't want to get too far off topic. Um but it's been a nagging question. My understanding is, is that they perform pretty well if you've got a, you know, like maybe two breeds, maybe three breeds, but right. I think once you start getting a real high variety, that they're not nearly as accurate. 
Okay. Yeah, just just anecdotally, um, we used them um, a lot in New Zealand, um, where we have certain breeds that we've been creating with at least 20 different recognized breeds in them for about mm -hmm. 100 years, and we were consistently getting really bizarre results, like Pomeranian in a, in yeah. a hound dog. <laughs> yeah. So Cause that's um, I feel like there's so many weird results that I don't totally believe. So it's like, do I even believe the ones that say that it does have Staffordshire Terrier or something in it, you know? Um, just never knew how, how much to trust them. or So that's interesting. They, they're also not designed to be tests of purebred dogs. So if you get a purebred dog and you run it, it may come up with other things besides just the genetic breed that the dog is supposed to be. But that's not what they're designed for. Okay. Interesting. Thanks. This is Sorry. this Sarah. The way that I think about it um, is not that um, those particular dogs mated, you know, even a hundred years ago. Just that that type of um, DNA material is similar enough to that breed's DNA material, you know, from the proto dog from hundreds of years ago. <laughs> okay. Sense. That's the way I think about it. I don't think about it as a as a hereditary tree, you know. Mhm. Mm I just think about it as like what DNA, what DNA do I have in my body left over from my ancestors, you know? Yeah, I like that because that's what I mean. That's how we always extrapolate it. Is like, oh yeah, that means that its parents were like, no. <laughs> yeah. That's too simple. Okay. That's the way I think of it. Thanks. Way to power through technical difficulties. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yes. guys. <laughs> and deploy complex mathematical analysis after powering through technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> always, always up for a challenge. It's always the Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. I think a, a Good job. I made this request, but since we have the Florida folks here, I think it would be really interesting to look at the study that was done in Florida on the success of a pit bull identification against the Y study and see if we could get yeah, Emily yeah. and Minnie to come and join us and talk about, like, was it different tests? Was it different dogs? That would be awesome. Yeah, that's really That would be really great. The Y study was actually looking at the live animal, watching it move around, whereas the Florida study was photographed, right? That's one of the differences. Oh, yeah. Thanks. That would make a difference. Yeah. I don't know. I had to just hunt to try to hunt for the Florida study, and I couldn't find it. So I don't know. I thought it was also at their shelter, but I... Perhaps it was just looking at photographs. So certainly, if um, it's a pretty like it's it's been one of the sort of givens that like we can't actually identify pit bulls. Um, and in studies from photographs, the the um, I think it was Boyce that study definitely like I took that test. I was worse than random. <laughs> um, <but> everything <laughs> suspiciously, a lot of them were Gordon Setter mixes. So I have a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, if in a live dog, shelter staff performed at above 90%, that's just, that's interesting. It would depend on context, so if you're in a community where there were a lot more near, well, I don't know if it's pure red, but if more dogs are genetically similar, you might have a higher rate of being able to identify those dogs than if you just got all these random mixes in. Yeah, right. that would be interesting so, okay. to look at the actual methodology behind the study. Okay. And how many of the dogs were like, like yeah. if you have a high ratio of I'm thinking of doing this in Baltimore, like you'd be pretty lucky. Uh, yeah. You just call everything a pit bull. Yeah, you yeah. would exactly. right. right. But there you go. There we are assuming that just because they all look like pit bulls, they're all pit bulls, right? right? Yeah, exactly. And you know, if in Baltimore you banned fit say you thought it would be a good idea to ban pit bulls, if that's true. Then it doesn't really matter if you can tell or not. You'd have a good chance of banning actual pit bulls if you just banned everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, are there cities where that have CSO still in place where they've been tracking numbers and they have a big decrease in dog bites? Like in Denver, have they seen a decrease in dog bites? The interesting thing is, we were at that dangerous dog conference and there was they were talking about statistics that the same number of pit bulls are still being used. Coming from somewhere. So, in that sense, it seems ineffective, but does anyone know? 
Yeah, so a couple of places have done studies like that, Ontario, Spain, Italy, Netherlands, and they've all found that there's no reduction in dog bites um, before and after, like compared to prior to the ban as compared to after. Um, I haven't found a study that has found a, a, a reduction in dog bites. But if other, maybe other people have, I didn't find it in my lit review. Do you know if those studies were looking at um, what breeds of dogs were biting, or was it just bites? Um, I'm not 100% sure about each one, just because they were all different studies. There's probably like four or five of them. Um, so I'm not 100% sure offhand. Um, but I know Ontario had one that uh, they looked at one, because they've had um, BSL in place since 2005. Um, Spain has had it in place for 10 years, and then Netherlands and Italy just repealed their BSL based on, I think, those studies. So I'm not as familiar offhand, sorry. <laughs> Any last question? Ask for it being unlikely to help with such an uncommon yeah. outcome is compelling. Oh, and yeah. even if it could help, yeah, in years and years it would take yeah. to have enough of the very uncommon outcome occur or not occur. Yeah, it's yeah, daunting at best. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. that's the only measure of success of breed specific bands. And that that's pretty goal. compelling. That like, if that's the goal, then that's probably not a good. <laughs> We're not reaching it. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't really it's... matter if you can identify pit bulls or not, because. <laughs> It doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good work, Danny. Thank you. Thank you.